scripture reading this morning is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, by great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Amen. Thank you, David. This morning we have our weapons of righteousness for our right hand and for our left. This is the the final lesson concerning the armor of God. We're looking at the final piece to that armor, the power of God. And if you'll recall, we're in Ephesians chapter 6 is the main focus that we have been looking at. In verse 10, he says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. As was just read for us, we recognize this is the power of God. So the armor of God is represented of His power. He's given us His power for our right hand and for our left. So when we look at the actual armor of God, what is placed within our hands? What is this armor in our right and left hand? If you will turn to Ephesians 6, as was, is on the screen in verse 16, beginning it says, In all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. As you recall, all of them can be extinguished because this type of word that is used for shield is thureos, which is where we get the word thura, door. And so this is a shield that will cover us from, from our head to our feet. And so recognizing that it can extinguish all of the fiery darts of the evil one. And so that's what's in our left hand or in one of our, one of our hands. Verse 17, and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we have here in our left hand, we have the Bible, we have the Word of God, and in our right we have the shield of faith. We take these up, and in doing so, we are protected. Well, when we look at this, there's going to be some important things that we discuss concerning the sword of the Spirit. In, in the first place, I ask the question, you know, what is, what is the sword and what is the Spirit? Notice here for this this right and left hand, we are protected. It's something that it's, if we just had the shield in our hand, for instance, we would be protected. We would, we would be able to be covered from every fiery dart. And it protects us. Our faith protects us, does it not? But what protects our faith? The Word of God. If we do not take up in the other hand the sword of the Spirit, we are not going to be protecting our faith, and our faith will die. Because it is from the Word of God that we gather our faith. Some will say, well, I just, I have my faith. My faith is what keeps me going. But sometimes my faith can be in something other than the Word of God, can it not? And so many times our faith will be maybe in just coming to worship every first day of the week. Uh, doing this routine that we've done over and over and over, and that's my faith. Uh, maybe it's even in the very seat that we're sitting in. You know, I remember visiting a, a congregation, and we were going to a gospel meeting, and, and uh, we sat in a seat, and a man walks up, and he said, Excuse me, you're in my seat. He just says, You're in my seat. Well, that was the first day of the meeting, and, and, and uh, I, I can't remember how that transpired. It was one of our elders' wives was there, and, and this is when we were in Ohio, and we were up in Kentucky for this gospel meeting. The next day, that man was there early. He wasn't there early to fellowship with anyone. He was there sitting in a seat. He made sure nobody got in his seat. And I went up to him and said, well, sir, I said, uh, can we sit in these seats? No, those seats are taken as well. That's what he told us. To him, that was, that was his concept of his faith. You see, when we go away from the Word of God, faith changes. Faith is in something that is not strong enough to keep us. I, I can't imagine if I was a visitor that just came in off the street and he told that to me, 
I'd see that a seat was more important than my soul. And you see the problem that that could have caused in the lives of others. And so we realize that these two are, they go literally hand in hand. That if we don't have the word of God, we will not have a strong faith. And for instance, you look at this coin behind me. You've seen this coin before as we were, we were discussing the shield of faith. And I, I mentioned this is a, a, a coin of Felix. And I, I mentioned that I found it on eBay and then I purchased it. Well, it came in the mail and it is, uh, it's actually smaller than a dime, and I have in this little protective case. This is literally the oldest thing that I own. And it's, it's almost 2,000 years old. And so you, you look at this, and actually on this coin, you can see a double shield. And I mentioned this is the actual shield that is referred to in this passage in Ephesians 6 and verse 17. Thureos, a door-sized shield. And it's on this coin of Felix. But if you'll look on the screen, I have it, it's, I've put it in red so that you can see it a little bit strongly, stronger. It's a double spear. On this coin, you can only see one of the tiny little shields. Uh, you, have, you have the shields, but you can only see one little spear, one section of it. So this is not nearly as valuable as this one would be. That's how I was able to purchase it, by the way. But you can still see the shield on it. And it's an, it's an incredible encouragement to me when I look at it. So recognizing that Felix saw that a shield is not going to be as good if you don't have the spear. In our case, the, the sword. So you have a weapon of, of defense and you have a weapon of offense. And so having the two together, you're going to be a strong soldier. And so as we're striving to be soldiers wearing the gospel armor, we will be strengthened. So this is referring to, this, this coin is often referred to in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 7 with the weapons of our righteousness for our right hand and for our left. The fact is, this is most likely what Paul was referring to when he talks about this. He knew about this coin. And actually, as I mentioned, this could have been held by by Paul, I don't know, but uh, I just think it's a neat thought. So when we look at this, though, what is the sword of the Spirit? Why is the Bible, why is God's Word referred to as a sword? There, there are some misunderstandings, though, when it comes to a sword, are there not? When I think about a sword, I think about not a weapon of righteousness... I think about a weapon of unrighteousness, a weapon that can cause pain, that can cause death, not life. And in fact, this picture behind me will represent this. As you see, this is a, this is, they call it the knife angel. An artist in Sussex, England, he actually took all of the confiscated knives in Britain. And he welded this statue, and this is a huge statue. I forgot to look at how tall it is. But these are all of the knives that have been confiscated in homicides or in robberies in anything that, they, that it was confiscated by the police. And it was turned in, and he was able to use these. And so this represents this, this death. Literally, some of these knives caused death. When we were, when we were living in Scotland, we were... Uh, we were reminded of this when we would we'd walk everywhere, because I, I may have mentioned to you at the time it was about $8 a gallon for gas, and so we would walk to the store, uh, or I'd ride my bike. And sometimes I'd walk through groups of kids that were just sitting around getting up to no good, and, and uh, sometimes they'd be drinking alcohol or whiskey, and, and, uh, and so sometimes when you're walking through those crowds, there would be some, some nerve-wracking experiences. One young man that was in charge of this one little group I would see him every once in a while, and, and I'd walk past. They didn't really bother me because I was an American. I wasn't really a part of their, uh, I guess, their culture, their, their side of town. And so I remember hearing about this one young man was killed. He was uh, killed in a knife fight. And I remember, so I'd seen him, and then I stopped seeing him. It was because he had been killed in a knife fight. Uh, there were several that had have died in our area where we were living, down the street from us, and they call them knife-related incidents. They don't call them gun-related incidents because the guns have been removed from their culture mostly. And so, you know what? They put on this, this at the bottom of this uh, statue, they had save a life, uh, turn in a knife. Save a life, turn in a knife. 
So they're, they're saying get rid of the knives in their culture. You see, it's a bigger problem than just the guns. It's a bigger problem than the knives. As you start trying to get rid of everything that someone would have, someone would probably be able to use a broom to, to instill the pain that they're trying to in, in, instill in someone. And so are we going to get rid of brooms? You, you see this, 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 this culture and this problem, they're striving to get rid of it so that they could save a life. So when I think about a sword, I don't think about life. So wait a second. This is the sword of the Spirit. This is the armor of God. Is this not positive? How can this be positive? Well, it's because it's the sword of the Spirit. The word for Spirit is pneuma. If you'll turn to John chapter 16. John 16, the word for Spirit is pneuma and it means breath or life. So when God made Adam from the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, we get this concept of the spirit, of the soul, God-given breath in our lungs, but it's also this deeper meaning of our spirit. But this is specifically referring to the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit wields this sword And so just like the sword is going to be misunderstood in our culture and the cultures around the world, the spirit also is going to be misunderstood. Because oftentimes anyone can say anything and say, the spirit told me. The spirit referenced this to me. I was moved by the spirit. Well, it's interesting that Jesus speaks about what the spirit does. How the spirit convicts the heart If you will, let's look at verse 4 of John 16, and we're going to go through verse 8. But I have said these things to you, that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. What has he said these things to him? Verse 2, they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming. Whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. The very first apostle that was killed was killed by a sword. James. And so, the... That is not a sword of the Spirit, but it would literally be a sword to try to quell the Spirit. Try to stop this group, as Brother Keith mentioned during our Lord's Supper. To try to just erase this from their history. When he says this, verse, verse, the end of verse 4, he says, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asked me, where are you going But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. This is referring back to what he said in chapter 14. When he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And then he says, I go to prepare a place for you. So he's explaining that he's about to leave. When their hearts are troubled, their their hearts are, are, are full of remorse as to what's going on. Why is this happening? Nevertheless, verse 7 I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, he will send him, or I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. This Helper that he's referring to is the Helper. Verse 13 refers to him as the Spirit of Truth that will come. So this helper is specifically concerning the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus explains what the Holy Spirit must do. And so we take what Jesus says because he says all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. And so with Jesus and this authority, he tells us what the Spirit does. And he convicts us concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So I guess you know what points we're going to be looking at this morning. He convicts us concerning sin. Well, how does he convict us concerning sin? Look at verse 9. Jesus explains it. He says, concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Because they do not believe in me. But the Spirit will convict those who do not believe in Jesus. When do we see this take place? Well, we see this in in Acts chapter 2, when Jesus When he ascended into heaven, and we understand after seven days, they remained in Jerusalem, and then they were they received power from on high. And we understand that they were convicted. Look at verse 37 
or verse 36 beginning, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain, this is what Peter said on the day of Pentecost, that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they were cut with the sword of the Spirit. They were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Why were they cut to the heart? How did this sword of the Spirit, how did it penetrate the heart? How did this affect them at this time? I thought they didn't believe. This is the same audience who 50 days prior had killed Jesus on the cross. That's why when he's saying, let all the house of Israel know for certain that this Jesus whom you crucified as Lord in Christ, why did it cut them to the heart this time? Man, Peter was just a really good speaker. He, he just was just, he was eloquent. He, he really... You know, we have evidence to say the opposite about Peter. He was really good about speaking and putting his foot in his mouth. But was this Peter and, and his ability that caused them to be convicted? We know 3,000 obeyed the gospel on the day of Pentecost. Did he, did he cause this change? This turn? No, look at verse 1 of chapter 2. We see what happened. Verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues or languages as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues and other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so we recognize this is the Spirit as Jesus promised He would send His Helper to come. This is what took place. Now, verse 5, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Verses 8 through 13 gives us this audience, possibly 15 nations that are represented. And these Galileans, they, they spoke one to two languages. They, they didn't speak all of these languages. Verse 6, and at this sound, what? The sound of the mighty rushing wind, verse 2. The multitude came together and they were bewildered. Because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. This is not some kind of spirit speak. Uh, th this, is, this is specific languages of the day. So they all were given the ability to speak to everyone. And everyone could hear it. And it was the sound of the mighty rushing wind that brought them together. It was the Holy Spirit that brought them together. And it was the Holy Spirit that kept them paying attention. Look at verse 7. They were amazed and astonished saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? So the Spirit was directing these apostles to speak on the day of Pentecost. And we understand that that was the evidence that they needed that was what caused their heart to be pricked jesus explained that he would convict the world concerning sin they were convicted concerning sin and they recognized that they had killed the messiah the savior that was to come they killed him and the response was they were cut to the heart how were they cut to the heart turn to hebrews chapter 4 we're we're just we're told about the word of god that it is a powerful sharp object verse 11 or entity i should say verse 11 let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience for the word of god is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Notice it is because of the word of God that we will not disobey. It is because of this, this, this division of soul and spirit, this sharpness, this living and active word of God that will cause us to wreck. It will actually find us where we are. It will discern our thoughts and our intentions. You know, as you're studying it, has there, have there ever been times when you're studying the Word of God and you see, whoa, I've not been doing this. You, you go to study it and you realize that it, it hits you where you are because you realize, wait a minute, I, I've been wrong. And you get that feeling of being cut to the heart. That's the Spirit. That's the word of God. 
And that is a wonderful blessing. Amen? That's a blessing to be able to experience that. The world wants to say, no, no, no. I, I don't want any of this because I want to remain the same. I don't want to change in any way. I, I'd rather change the word of God. I'd, I'd rather change the sword so that it doesn't hurt me so much. Let's, let's dull that, that sword a little bit. Let's make it to where it's just, you know, we'll just have a little object on the, on the wall. That'll be something that's for us. You know, it's not very sharp. You know, my dad has a, uh, he's got this massive William Wallace sword that was given to him when he, he came over for a gospel meeting and they gave him a sword. And this passage was inscribed on it. Well, the word of God was sharper because that sword was dull as you can, can imagine. There was no blade on it at all. And so he has it hanging on the wall. And my boys, our boys are up in Kentucky right now and uh, with uh, giving mom and dad a break. And, uh, and I have no concern about that sword being on the wall in touching distance. Because it is as blunt as can be. It is as dull as can be. We want a sword that's dull. But the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it will pierce us in our heart well, why is this a good thing? Because it gives us life. And without it, we have death. Without it, we're separated from God. And when people recognize their separation from God, that is truly a blessing. And in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4, Jesus refers to this as a blessing. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Parakaleo is the word for to comfort there. And it's interesting, in John chapter 16, when he's referring to the helper that would come there in verse 7. The helper is also, you may have the comforter, the parakletos. It's the same Greek word, but the noun form. And so we see that the Spirit gives us comfort. But blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. If you mourn recognizing because you were poor in spirit and you saw the kingdom, you recognize the kingdom recognizing that you were nothing in comparison to God that causes you to mourn over the sin in your life, you will be comforted. How so? How are we comforted? Because of the second aspect and quality of this sword of the Spirit, of the Comforter, of the Holy Spirit. He convicts us concerning righteousness. If you will, turn back to John chapter 16. John 16. We're going to look at verse 10. It says, Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. You see, when Jesus is going to the Father, He would send this comforter. He would send the Holy Spirit, and He would give them comfort concerning righteousness. What is this? What does that look like? Well, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, those who received the words of Peter on the day of Pentecost, those who received his words were baptized 3,000 souls that day. And they were added to the body. Those who received his word. Well, the word specifically in verse 40, he said, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who received that word were baptized. How did they feel once they were baptized? What was the result? Comfort. Comfort. The same ones who had been convicted were comforted. Those who had been cut to the heart received help. They received a peace of mind. And so in looking at this, I'm wondering, did all of them receive peace of mind on that day, everyone who had been cut to the heart, did every single one of them receive peace of mind? This is important for us to see that the Spirit convicts us concerning our sin, but He also convicts us concerning righteousness, meaning our obedience. We must obey. But we all have a choice to obey. That's why after he explains, when, when they ask, what shall we do to be saved? They're asking, what shall we do concerning the, the Savior? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. There was something that they had to do. And all who received his word were baptized. Why? Because he told them to. 
But all who received it, some didn't receive it. Some thought these men are drunk. Some of them tried to explain away the Spirit. They, some may have even been convicted that they had been wrong but didn't obey. You know, it's not just about being sorry for the sin in your life. That's not repentance. That's part of it, amen? But it's being sorry for the sin in your life, but being willing to obey and follow the teachings of God's Word, amen? This is why the Spirit... This is the balance. Our faith must have works. And we'll see that in just a moment in James chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. But this is the third quality of the Spirit. The Spirit convicts us concerning judgment. If you look at John 16, and we'll look at verse 12 through 15. Well, verse 11, it says, Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. The Spirit is going to judge the ruler of this world. When we look at this, this is specifically referring to Satan. We understand he is the prince of the power of the air. He's the ruler of this world. And he's going to be judged. And so the Holy Spirit will judge him. Uh, look at verse 12 and following. It will Notice how he is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Who's he referring to? The spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. Who's he referring to? The apostles. It was the apostles who were guided into all truth. How do we know that the Holy Spirit is our comforter? How do we know that it was good that Jesus was going to go away? That Jesus said it? Did Jesus ever write one word? Where do we get the red letters? There are so many that want the red letters of Jesus, but where did we get the red letters? They came through the hand of the apostles, and those who had their hand had laid their hands on them, and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. So through this, we have this conviction concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And so it is in this word that, the, that, that Satan is judged, because he is the spirit of truth. And the truth judges all. Verse 14, He will glorify me, Jesus says. The Holy Spirit will glorify me, for He will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that He will take what is mine and declare it to you. God has spoken. Amen? God speaks today. Amen? Amen? God is speaking through His Word, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because He convicted these men to speak and to write down this truth. But recognizing that, the, that Satan is to be judged by this, well, that's all well and good, right? That's, it's over. He's judged. We've got nothing to worry about. We've got to recognize that He is going to be convicted concerning judgment. We understand that there is a lake of fire that is prepared for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25 and verse 41. But if you look at James chapter 2 and verse 19, we see something very specific concerning Satan. He says, but someone will say, or verse 19, he says, You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Even the demons are convicted. Convicted that Jesus is Lord. They're convicted. They shudder. But they don't go any further. They're not convicted concerning righteousness. They will not obey. So to believe only, to have faith only, is literally to hold up a, a shield only and, and not take up the sword of the Spirit. There's no way a demon would take up the sword of the Spirit. And to be a, a powerhouse for God, there is no way that a demon could be converted. Because they will not bow down and worship. They will not repent of the sin that causes them to shudder. Because they are demons. So in what is he referring to? Look at verse 18. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. 
So you're faithful, but I'm doing some good things over here. Look at the good that I'm doing. You know, I don't have any faith, but, you know, look at the great thing. I feel so good about the good things that I'm doing. But I'm not as faithful as that individual over there. They have their faith, and I've got my works. He says, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Verse 17, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. The demons themselves have a faith concerning sin that is a conviction, literally causing them to shudder, but they will not go any further. You see, God has spoken. He has brought the judgment. Are you willing to fall in line with what He teaches? Are you willing to go the next step and to be convicted concerning righteousness, to obey the word of God. Those on the day of Pentecost who obeyed were added to the church. Are you here this morning? And maybe you have been convicted concerning wrong in your life and, and you don't know where to turn. Turn to God. Because the judgment has been laid. The word of God has been given. God has spoken. And all we're striving to do is follow His Word. Not our opinion, not what we think. Following His Word within its context to understand what He has laid down for us is why we're here. Amen? That's why we're here to worship God in spirit and in truth. May we seek that balance this morning. But maybe you're here this morning and you have not sought that balance. Maybe you're doing great things. You can do some great things for God, but if you've not submitted to His will, to His authority, and repented of the sin in your life, you are still in your sins. Are you willing to come confessing that Jesus is Lord, repenting of your sins, and being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness? We understand that when you do so, you rise from that watery grave and you walk in a new life. You're a new creature. You are born again. That's, that's the greatest comfort there is. Amen? Do you need that comfort this morning? The comforter is here to bring that for you. But maybe you, you rose to walk in newness of life and you've not been walking in that new life. Maybe, that, maybe it's become old. Maybe it's become uh, dried out. Do you need to repent? of sin that's been ongoing, that you've been struggling with, you have an opportunity to be comforted by the Comforter through us, who are a part of the body, who have been added by the Spirit to the church. We're here to encourage you. Will you take on that encouragement, that comfort? Whatever your need is, won't you come? All together we stand and sing. Invitation.